This amazing woman is extra relevant today during Ace Week 2022 because I believe Julia Morgan was Arrow Ace. She's apparently not well known outside of California, which as a Californian is hard for me to imagine because here she kind of set the artistic tone for the state. Her architecture is everywhere. The epicenter of it is probably Mills College, which has at least five buildings that she designed. In 1897, Julia Morgan was the first woman at UC Berkeley to earn a civil engineering degree. Then she became the first woman admitted to the prestigious architecture program at the École des Beaux-Arts in Paris, ooh la la. In 1904, Julia Morgan became the first licensed woman architect in California and started her own architectural firm. But it was in 1903 that Susan Mills hired her to design the first freestanding bell tower on a college campus. So if you associate college campuses with big fancy bell towers, that was Julia Morgan. She and Susan Mills started that trend. In 1906, you might know, a massive earthquake just demolished this whole area. But the Campanile at Mills College stood proudly above it all. And that pretty much launched Julia Morgan's career. If you can build a multi-story tall bell tower that doesn't give a crap about a huge freaking earthquake, you're going to be in demand here. It takes a lot of inner power to go against everything that society pushes onto you. It's a lot like keeping your balance during an earthquake. I don't recommend that you stay standing during an earthquake, like stop, drop, and roll or whatever. But the ground shimmies under you during an earthquake. It feels like jelly, destabilizing, unannounced. The ground shimmies under you when you're queer, trans, and or intersex too. It's hard to get a stable foothold. It's hard for us to find our center. This is a photo of the Berkeley City Club pool she designed. From the right angle, the reflections of the arches above it create concentric circles. Julia Morgan was coming of age at a time of both wonderful freedom and intense restriction. Her father was apparently both terrible at business and unlucky in it. Her mom was rich and ran the family and its finances. So Julia witnessed the strength and power of women on a daily basis. She met a New York cousin-in-law who was a successful architect, Pierre Lebrun. He sparked her interest in architecture and strongly encouraged her to go to college. The 1880s, he was like, no, you got it. You love this and you need to do it. She turned out to be brilliant at math and her mother supported her study of it is also just shocking for the time. She graduated from Oakland High School in 1890 and her mother suggested a debutante coming out party to announce her eligibility for marriage. It's the opposite of what I think of as a coming out party. Julia managed to convince her that first she should start her own career and that before that she should be allowed to go to college. There wasn't an architecture program at Berkeley but there was a famed architect named Bernard Maybach who was teaching geometry there. So she enrolled and she became a star student in his class and became one of his boys. These students he treated as his architectural protégés. Both Maybach and Lebrun had gone to the Ecole de Beaux-Arts and both of them encouraged her to go herself because it was the best education you could get in the world in architecture and had been rumored to start considering admitting women. Obviously now's the time to go. Julia was able to sail to France and live there long enough to learn French and study for the rigorous entrance exam. So okay, I can kind of see 
her being like, I'm just going to go, and eventually they'll let me in. Because if she had to not only study for the exam, but also learn French, she probably figured she had time. The school only took the top 30 candidates in the entrance exam. It was like 400 students every year taking it. She failed it the first time. By failed, I mean she got like a lower than more than 90 percent like failed is a really a harsh phrase for something where you have to score i keep reading all of these sources that are like well she failed it the first two times and i'm like i mean sure but also bite me the second time she actually made it into the top 30 but her scores were artificially deflated after the fact too so like double bite me. People have struggled to decide what her orientation was for decades. Did she eschew romance so that she could keep working? Did she avoid publicity in order to cover up lesbian affairs? Was she married to her career, simply too busy to meet anybody? A few pieces identify her as a lesbian. The most concrete theory links her name with that of queer director Dorothy Arzner. But Arzner's partner was Marion Morgan. Do your research, people! Victoria Kastner writes, Julia Morgan has ever even been co-opted as a designer of queer space an assertion based not on evidence about her sexual preferences, for nothing supports this claim, but solely on the sensuality of her extraordinary swimming pools. Okay, but look at this f***ing pool. Look at this f***ing pool. This photo is a complex and gorgeous shot of the Roman pool at Hearst Castle. Naked faux Roman statues, rich gold and royal blue mosaics covering every inch of wall and ceiling, reflected once again in the pool so that they seem perfect and infinite of design. And again, arches, arches, arches. You know how allosexism and heterosexism are. If it's sensuous, it must be sexual. If it's sexual, the straights perceive it as dirty. If it's sexual and dirty, it must be gay. And if it's sexless, it must again be unnatural, queer. Here's the same pool, empty, revealing that beneath the water the mosaics continue. Anyway, if that gets queer people credit for this incredible mosaic around and within the interior pool at Hearst Castle, I'll take it. Kastner isn't wrong, just straight. Julia Morgan created queer spaces because she was queer. In fact, reading between the lines suggests that many of Julia Morgan's commissions were for the queers. For instance, she designed a home for Malcolm Goddard, a very rich, lifelong bachelor, who mysteriously remained single, his much publicized and long-awaited 1913 nuptials, having fallen through without so much as a murmur from the press. She designed many houses for rich-ass unmarried women, Miss Jessie D. Wallace, Miss N. Drown, Miss H. Hitchcock. But then there's the obvious example. She designed a very queer house for queer women. This house for doctors Clara Williams and Elsie Reed Mitchell in 1915. Imagine being lesbian doctors in 1915 who were essentially married, buying and building a house together, being out to your architect and being like, how can we work together to create this best possible house for us as a couple? This is just amazing to me. And they went to the right person, not only because Julia Morgan got it, but because Julia Morgan is also famous for specifically being really good at listening to her clients. This was something she did with all her clients. 
in all of her buildings, no matter what they were for, and she wasn't going to stop just when the building happened to be for an orphanage or for immigrant women who were living in poverty. She was like, hello, these people need my help way more than you do. And that is part of why I love her so much. The Mitchell Williams house is built on a little bit of a hillside. And normally in a house like this, if you have an office especially, you would either have the downstairs area be your office and probably have a separate entrance. And then, you know, your main living space is the top floor. Or maybe you have the main entrance to the whole house be downstairs and you can have your office there, but you have a staircase right inside the front door leading up to the bedrooms. Instead, Julie Morgan set it up so the main entrance is on that top floor. And if you go in, you're in like a little hallway. On your left, there's the medical office with built-in bookshelves. Thank you, Julia Morgan, for all your built-in bookshelves. Oh, you're going to see so many bookshelves. This is what I want in my life. But anyway, once you stop being distracted by all the bookshelves, you would see doors in front of you, too, that led to a massive living room. Just huge, more built-in bookshelves. A fireplace at the far distant end, if you can see that far away. If you knew them and you were a guest in their home, you might make it all the way to the far end of the living room and through a little door there that led to the dining alcove. And maybe if you knew them really well, you would make it through the door there into the kitchen. And at the end of the kitchen, there's another door which leads into the garage and the garage leads you out to the street again. <laughs> This is hilarious to me. It's basically just like a little horseshoe that spits you back out onto the street. If you backtrack all the way to the dining alcove, there is a second door there. And it probably looks to you, a visitor in their home, like it's just a linen closet with tablecloths and napkins for that dining table. If you get curious and open it, you see stairs. They probably assume lead down to, like, a basement. The stairs lead to the main living area, their private living area, where the bedrooms are. Soundproofing so much privacy. There's no way to accidentally wander in on the bedrooms. Tons of light. They get to be in their own little world down there. There's no way for their clients to get lost finding the bathroom because there's a bathroom right off the medical office. In fact, there's a bathroom right in the medical office. So I want to close by looking at the home of Drs. Elsie Lee Mitchell and, Dr., uh, and Clara Williams. They were both OBGYNs with a private practice in Berkeley. And they're dressed in these uniforms because they both went to, to uh, Armenia in the wake of um, Turkish ma massacres in 1919. So they were um, um, quite, quite well-known um, doctors, actually, at the time. Now, from the exterior, their brown shingle bungalow in the Berkeley Hills isn't particularly striking as any sort of revolutionary architecture, except in the whole pantheon of the Bay Tradition style and its general contributions to um, modern architecture and depleting rainforests, or not rainforests, but redwoods. Um, so it doesn't look remarkably exciting. Living room and dining room, it's a very open floor plan. Probably one of the most open floor plans in a Julia Morgan house. And again, we, can, we think of that as very modern. And then we go downstairs. And this is striking because the upstairs is so open, right? And so public. And the downstairs has the bedrooms and the bathroom. And it's really... Um, cut up into spaces, so that's normal for a living area or you know, bedroom area. But there's some, some interesting things. You'll note the guest bedroom may have basins. Now, maybe this is a sign of um, a belief in sanitation, right? They're doctors, so they want their guests to wash their hands in their rooms. But I think it probably has more to do with privacy. And then there's bedroom number one and bedroom number two, the two master bedrooms. 
Notably, they share the bathroom, the most intimate space or private space in a house. And so clearly, Elsie Lee Mitchell and Clara Williams were working out how to have modern public lives and grow a clientele, as well as to act upon um, a lesbian sexuality, a lesbian um, sexual orientation, in a way that wouldn't um, be scandalous. Cottage core may belong to lesbians, but I'm claiming whatever this is for arrows and aces. It's arts and crafts, but maybe craft core. This is craft core, and it is art. Julia Morgan herself lived one version of what I think of as the Arrow Ace life. Something about her just neatly repelled all ideas of a traditional relationship. She was not interested in that life. She didn't brook any discussion. She had tons of work, but she didn't care about money. She wasn't working for the money. She wasn't amassing wealth. She didn't live in a fancy house. She rented out rooms in her own house to other working women. Not so that she could make money, just because she had space and she was happy to share it. To me, that evokes and speaks to the isolation that can come from our allocentric and very straight society. That's one way we fight it, by renting out rooms but to other people like us, by sharing what we have with each other. You know, like my ideal life would probably be to have a big house that was full of bedrooms that I could rent out to other, other queer people in general, but particularly just to other arrows and or aces wanting to live in community and also mutual aid is queer love and i think that for many a specs it's one of our main kinds of queer love our whole lives julia morgan treated her clients with respect and dignity collaborating with them as if they were her equals even though society told her they weren't to me that evokes both a generally queer sense of respect for others humanity and an autistic lack of regard for hierarchy. She treated her employees with respect and dignity. A collection called 20 on 2020 Vision Perspectives on Diversity and Design says every Christmas she divided up all her dividends with all her employees. She didn't keep anything for herself. Everyone was her big family. To me, that evokes the long-standing queer tradition of chosen families. She was known for creating spaces where you immediately felt at home. She worked with local materials and organic patterns so that a house might feel like part of nature around it. And she centered what her clients needed and wanted instead of what was in style or what was conventionally acceptable. To me, that evokes the deep queer need for home for a sense of belonging. She understood the deep need to feel accepted and safe, no matter who you were. She obviously had a deep and passionate special interest and she felt built her life around it. To me, her disinterest in what society told her she should do or wanted her to do, her stolid and well-planned self-protection against that, and her brilliance in her special interests, mark her as a fellow autist. Oh yeah, and also the fact that her professional style played down or even rejected language, both written and spoken, which has resulted in a limited sampling of her thoughts and ideas as expressed in her own words. Some of us are hyperverbal. I write more than I do anything, but a lot of us are at the opposite extreme of that spectrum as well. And of course, um, a comparatively high percentage of autistic people are ace. 1.5% of allistic people are ace. 10% of autistic people are ace. In this brief but absolutely delightful abstract, 30% of allistic people were queer compared to 69.7% of autistic people. Lest you imagine that queers aren't taking over the world, 
We goddamn well are. Julie Morgan loved reinforced concrete, which she had discovered in Paris. It's concrete that's been threaded through with steel rebar. She was fascinated by its combination of plasticity and stability. She was probably the first person in the country to use it for an actual building. Because of her stability and flexibility, the Campanile still rings today. Julia Donahoe, the architect and lawyer who led the campaign to award Julia Morgan the 2014 AIA gold medal, 99 years after she built that house, says she knew what she was doing and there was nobody else who knew what she was doing. To add to her record-breaking acts, Morgan is the, still the architect who has designed the most completed buildings, over 700 of them. Karen McNeil says, When the Campanile survived the quake of 1906 without a crack, that just catapulted Morgan into the highest echelon. She calls Morgan herself a spectacle, and says, For 49 years she shaped a whole region's view of itself. If you ever lived in California, somewhere you were touched by her architectural genius. That's Arrow and Ace History. If you have requests for other deep dives into queer history, we'll leave them in the comments below. If you want to know more about these lesbian doctors or other topics like these, hit that like button and be sure to subscribe because more is coming up soon. Check out my Patreon below where you can get everything from cute cat pictures to amazing online queer events. And I want to give a special shout out to the Internet Archive and its Open Library Project, without which this video literally could not exist. I strongly suggest donating to them for anyone who can. Grow and support them. Throw them some money. Oh my lord. The talking, the talking is worse. The talking is worse with the camera on. <laughs> Worse. Oh, and check out my Patreon, where I should have thought of what to say before I hit the record button.